Thank you, everyone. So, good morning. So, my name is Shwaranjini, and I'm going to be talking about my experience uh, on keeping electric vehicles secure by proposing the need for a CAN security framework. So, a little bit about me. So, I, as um, the NC has already mentioned, I am a security engineer with DCSV Singapore. And uh, we have a global presence, and there is also a division right there in Germany. Uh, we specialize in smart cabins, in smart driving, including self-driving capabilities, and we have over 35 years in the automotive industry. So before working in the ASV, I had a short stint at National University of Singapore, where I got the chance to hack into one of these famous yellow Bluetooth bikes that you see in the picture right there. And I was able to hack into them and was able to ride it without having to pay for it as a part of their bug bounty program that got me super excited about vehicle security. And then I transitioned from bikes to cars, which is my current focus. Uh, I also have a master's in information security from Carnegie Mellon University. And for fun, I play a musical instrument sometimes. And every weekend, you can see me paddling on, along the Kalang River in Singapore. So today, I'm going to be starting with an introduction of what is CAN and the security challenges that come along with it. Then I'm going to be walking you through my journey of developing an intrusion detection system over the years through different phases and what are the lessons I've learned along the way. And finally, I will be proposing a CAN security framework that addresses some of the uh, problems that I've encountered so far. So let's start with CAN. So what is CAN? CAN, or Controller Area Network, is the main communication channel inside an electric vehicle or the crux of an automotive system. So it connects all the import important components that you can think of, like cruise control, brake system, air conditioning, gateway, you name it. So everything is connected through this CAN bus, and these components are called as electronic control units. And CAN, CAN is the channel that connects them and enables the communication between them. So the main benefits of using this protocol is that it's inexpensive, it's durable, it's very lightweight and reliable, and it's also broadcast based, unlike peer to peer based, which means that it has much less overhead. And uh, that's primarily one of the reasons that electric vehicles use CAN as one of their major communication channels. So, a little bit of a deep dive into a CAN header or a CAN frame. So, you can see a number of fields there. But there are three key fields that I would like to highlight. One is the arbitration ID. The other one is the LC, which is the data length code. The data length code is basically gives you the number of bytes of payload of data that follows along with it. So here we have to eight bytes of data. So that would be the DLC, which indicates how much of payload is sent along in that CAN frame and the time at which the frame was itself sent and the data itself. So the key feed here is arbitration. So let's turn with that. So in an electric car, we have many electronic uh, control units that want to talk to each other. And they have the scan bus, which is their communication channel. So each um, each electronic control unit has a specific set of message IDs that is always on the lookout for. And once it encounters that message ID on the CAN bus, it uh, reacts to it and starts a communication with it. So since it's broadcast based and many of the electronic control units would try to do this simultaneously, the CAN bus has a process called arbitration, which gives priority to which message can be executed first. 
So if you have a lower message ID, then you have higher priority. So by logic, if you have 000, which is the lowest you can go, then your message would be given the highest priority and would be executed first on the CAN bus. And every other message has to wait a bit more. So this number is represented by the 11-bit arbitration ID as referenced here. So a little bit more into the different type of CAN messages. So we have two broad classifications. One is called the periodic messages. So the periodic messages are messages sent periodically to get the statuses of different electronic control units at different times. So uh, I'm an ECU A and I want to talk to ECU B and I want to know the current status at this particular point of time. So I just sent messages periodically to know, hey, what's your current status? So that kind of messages is periodic. So in the, in, uh, the second type of one, which is called as event trigger, is messages that only occur when a particular event happens. So you, someone locks the door, someone unlocks the door, you apply brakes on the car. Um, these kind of events that are happening will trigger a bunch of messages that are only pertaining to that. And those kind of messages are called as event trigger messages. So if you see the screenshot here, this is from a CAN database file. You can see two words that's, that comes up very often. One is cyclic X and the other one is spontan X. So anything that's called a cyclic refers to the periodic messages. And anything that's called spontan X, which is much, much fewer than the cyclic X messages, refers to the event triggered messages. And you might be wondering, looking at the screenshot, what is this X and why is there a can extended written at the end of it? What's the significance of it? So um, the X refers to an extension or an extender, uh, and it's called as can flexible data rate, which allows you to send up to 65, 64 bytes of data and has a longer identifier. It basically allows you to send more data in a single CAN frame as opposed to the original classic CAN. So what does this mean from a security perspective? So historically, when CAN was introduced by Robert Bosch in 1983, it was only meant to be like a very lightweight, reliable mode of communication and there is no authentication or authorization that is built into the protocol itself. So in order to ensure security, you have to take additional mechanisms. So one such mechanism is building a model or component that will do the authentication or authorization for you. So um, coming to that, you have one such examples of, of, of the model is in Autosar's SecoC or Secure Onward Communications. So basically what this module does is, as referenced by the figure, it generates a lot of message authentication code and freshness value, which is used to authenticate the electronic control units communicating on the CAN bus and send this keys plus data in the CAN frame, the along which which allows you to send more data. So if you're using a classic CAN, sending this type of information would mean that um, it will not leave, leave you space for anything else, and it's not your best bet. But CAN FD can allow you to send your security-related data as well as the data it's originally intended for. So, but there are two challenges that come along with this. One main important one is that you have to secure the keys itself, safeguard them. And the next important challenge is that Tecosi has 2.5 times more bandwidth than can itself. 
So in certain situation, which means that you cannot use this always because you would have to sacrifice your bandwidth for security. And we don't want that, do we? So what other option do we have to ensure that there is security and the, the CAN bus itself, the communications are secure? So here comes intrusion detection systems. So many idea solutions sit on different electronic control unit components and monitor the messages along the CAN bus. So an example could be gateway, which can look at uh, messages coming in from different electronic control units. Um, so there are broadly two very different type of um, ideas with pertaining to CAN. One is flow-based, which only needs the bare essentials. The bare essentials, meaning the message ID and the time at which the uh, frame is sent. You don't need the data, you don't need anything else. So this kind of information, this kind of flow-based ADS is useful um, because it's very generic and you can use it almost in many, almost in all the vehicle models that you can think of because it's very generic. It's not data specific, it's not vehicle specific. So once you develop an algorithm, you don't have to go around changing it again and again. Uh, whereas packet based is focuses completely on the data packets or payload itself. So this is also useful in certain situations. Um, so these are the two major types and hybrid is a mix of both of them. So when I started to develop an intrusion detection system, I started with a prototype. So my goal was to create a working prototype from data that is publicly available. So I wanted to identify common attack scenarios and generate attack scenarios pertaining to that. And along with my team, and we wanted to add some machine and deep learning features to this prototype and finally test the results on a PC to see how our IDS algorithm has fared so far. So um, upon a lot of uh, literature survey, I came upon a very highly cited academic paper called OTIDS, which proposed a novel intrusion detection system from the HCRL lab in Korea. So they had three common attack scenarios, which is denial of service, fuzzy, and impersonation. Their data was publicly available, which is kind of hard to find in uh, automotive domain. The algorithm itself was fairly easy to implement. And so this seemed like a good reference point to start off my uh, prototype. So I wanted to generate more such data. So I used Vector Scanoe Network Box. It's basically a simulation tool. And use, I used this and programmed more attack data sets based on the reference model that uh, I have with me. So some of the attack scenarios, the first one is denial of service. So as the name suggests, the goal is to either jam the canvas or try to get the highest priority on the canvas. So the way to do this is to inject messages that would that are the highest priority, which in case would be 000, which is the lowest you can go. You just try to just like spam it in a very short period of time. So either you get the highest priority or the canvas becomes invalid. Either of this. Uh, becomes a denial of service attack. The next one is fuzzy. So it basically looks, uh, is a spoofing attack where it injects spoofs, random plan ID and data values. So for example, replay attacks is a common example of a fuzzy attack. So uh, and a few other examples could be, you have the right payload and data but you send them in wrong timing. So you have a time that is expected in a normal scenario, but then you just send it along in a, in a uh, different timing. And another one is you have the wrong data, 
but then you send it in the exact sequences that is expected in a normal scenario. So these are all examples of a uh, fuzzy attack. So the data format that was followed in this um, uh, model was a request response model where the request was identified with a data length code of zero and the response had a data length code of either four or eight and it had the same ID so we can recognize that it's a, a response and came along with the payload after that. So the data was collected from a Kia Soul vehicle and uh, for the fuzzy attack, the authors had two responses and they randomized one of it as original and the other responses attack. So I graphed the packets uh, as they arrive. Um, if you can uh, look at the figure here. And uh, so anything any packet, any response that arrives after the seventh message is considered as a lost packet. So we only considered that particular window as a legitimate ones. And from the figure in an attack-free state, uh, most of the packets, even if they arrive late, they arrive, they arrived at a pretty good uh, uh, time interval. It didn't take too long of a time to uh, get the response to arrive. But if you look at denial of service and fuzzing, when I graphed the arrival time, you can see that they significantly increased in both these scenarios. So here you see 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which means an attack is happening and the response came much, much later. And in fuzzing, as I mentioned, there's two responses and they randomly chose this to be the legitimate one. So... Uh, as usual, you can just look at the graphs. You can just see, oh, there is something happening. There is an attack that's got happening here. You know, it does not look normal or it does not look like it's in an attack-free state. So that's a very good indicator. So uh, with the help of my team, we added more machine and deep learning features to this model and tested it. And it came from 85% to 94% on the PC which looked good, right? The numbers look good. But then I realized one thing. They didn't mean anything. When I requested data from the original equipment manufacturers, I realized that most scanned data, they do not follow the message request format at all and instead follow the sequencing format. So which means what I had implemented was a corner case scenario and not the norm. So one of the biggest takeaways that I got was to never trust the research scope blindly, even if, if it was highly uh, uh, cited uh, research. So it was back to the drawing board. So this time I wanted to create a proof of concept. And I was very careful to model the attack data based on real industry data. And instead of testing it on a PC, I tested it on a Q03, which is to say it's high-powered ECU. So this ECU is mainly used for um, autonomous vehicle ca uh, capabilities. So the attack scenarios were uh, similar to the prototype ones, uh, denial of service. And for uh, fuzzing, uh, I also included the categories of GAN messages into account. So for fuzzing, I send packets that model the original one, but it's injected in a timing that is different from what is expected in a normal scenario. And it applies to both the periodic and event but messages. But for frequency, it's essentially the same as fuzzing, but it only applies to periodic messages and not the event triggered messages. I also added an additional attack scenario, which is any ID which is not recognized by the original equipment manufacturer is also considered as an attack packet. So I labeled that as alien ID. So this was the model for the proof of concept. So I would have the normal data set and there would be a pre-processing algorithm that would uh, understand the um how it behaves in a normal scenario. So once I knew that, uh, we generated attack data sets using the Kinoe vector box and fed it into the IP. This is the um, IP03. 
So there were two detectors, which uh, are part of the intrusion detection system. The first one is a logistic detector or a statistic-based algorithm, which takes really less resources and weeds out common attack scenarios like denial of service and alien ID. The next one was a learning-based detector, which used a deep learning-based algorithm to filter out the fuzzy and frequency. Eventually, it will just give out if it's a zero, which is a normal, or one, which is an attack. So um, the results looked something like this for these statistic-based ones. So for the alien ID, it's anywhere from a 98 to 100%, which is really, really good. And for the denial of service, it was either 82 to 83 percent, which seems really good and is very compatible to the industry standard. So if you combine both of them, the accuracy goes a little bit up to closer to 91 percent. So this seems pretty good and in line with what I had wanted. So for the... Uh, Deep learning algorithms, it ranged from 85 to 98%. And this screenshot here is from IP03 once the deep learning algorithm is executed. So it just says that the accuracy is 100% here for that particular data set. And it just gives you some statistic of the messages that were being processed. So what were the challenges that I encountered during this, this phase of um, proof of concept? So the first one was the to fit the statistic-based algorithm into the MCU since it takes up very less resources and to weed out the common attacks like DOS and alien ID. But then I found out that there was some straightforward way to get the ID and timestamp in IP03 because of the way that it was designed. And I needed to like make some um, changes in, in on a deeper level in order to be able to do that. So, um, and the second challenge, which you might all have guessed, is that we need to make sure that the intrusion detection system is not the sole focus of the ACU itself. So it should not take up a lot of the resources, be it if you put it on system on chip or if you put it on MCU, it has to take much, it has to perform uh, very well and take up very little resources as possible. So uh, these, the, the proof of concept was a fairly good success, but the, it, this brought me to a very important question. And the question was, I used data sets which are simulated and the IDS algorithms did really well on them. So that's great. But that does not equal to a real car. So if you actually deploy this IDS algorithms in a real car, would it still work the same way as it is intended to? Because in a real car, you can have like some latency, some delay, some legitimate packets can come later than they're expected to. And what happens to the ideas algorithms then? Would it, would it still perform uh, as it's supposed to? Or would it give you a lot of false positives and false negatives, which we want to avoid? So in order to answer the question, I propose the scan security framework. So I wanted to test, I wanted to set up a CAN test bit, which can be used to run a CAN bus in a realistic environment, and then develop a pen test tool, which can inject uh, uh, messages into the CAN. So this is basically a, this would be like an attack toolbox that injects messages into the CAN test bed in a live environment. So one of the main outputs that you can get from here is a very realistic attack data set that can be fed into the IDS algorithms. You can see how the algorithms fare. You can make modifications if it's not up to expectations. And then you can again feed it over here. So it's like a continuous loop uh, for improvement of security. So uh, an example, just a very uh, example of a CAN test bed setup is I have a wired CAN harness setup with a lot of nodes. And then, you know, some of which is uh, uses Arduino and simulates different uh, components in a car, like a door, engine, HVAC. And then there are some nodes which have the much advanced ECUs from DSA, like IP03. So, and some nodes which are left open, so we can add more issues later on. We may want to continue testing 
And this this connects to a USB CAN interface and and then connects to a PC, which runs the software message injection toolbox or the Pentest toolbox, which um, performs the attacks needed for intrusion detection systems. So uh, you can also have other related components for the ECUs to work, like sensors or actuators and other platform environments to make this run smoothly. And uh, so the Pentest toolbox itself would uh, start off with emulating denial of service attacks, uh, fuzzy replay or man in the middle attacks, then the frequency attacks by manipulating curiosity and to be primarily developed in Python. So uh, with this, I'm going to go to the end of my presentation. So here are some of the key takeaways that I want to share with you. One is that if you have a highly cited research, it doesn't always mean that it's useful in the industry. So always model a system based on real data. And my opinion is that hybrid IDS is the best bet moving forward. Uh, this uh, flowchart here represents a model for my proof of concept, which took up very less resources. So I had a statistic-based algorithm, which leads out most of the attacks and a deep learning one, which uh, we did out the advanced one. So if you want, if uh, companies want to do something more specific for payload, it can be just added to this model over here without compromising on the resources which means that it would be a, a really good solution, in my opinion. And finally, I do not consider my prototype to be a total failure because I got a chance to be here and tell you what not to do. So with that, I would be ending my talk. And I'm open to questions now from the audience. Hello. All right, folks. So it is question time. Does anyone have any questions for, oh, we have a questioner. Come up, please. Hi, I have a question related to your IDS model uh, and related to your OEM data that you received. So isn't it like that you probably have to train a model for each different type of car model because the data will always look different, maybe even inside the same OEM model line? Uh, okay, yes. So uh, basically, if you use a flow-based IDS, which is what I do, the IDs would be different for each uh, uh, each vehicle model because each uh, OEM have different IDs and different way of processing them. But the logic itself would be same. But you have to, as you're right, you have to retrain it for every uh, single model. Uh, depending upon their their own um, IDs and specifications, but the core algorithms would uh, remain the same if you use a flow-based model. Okay, thanks. And question two, if you don't mind. Mm. Um, in the very beginning, you were talking about using message authentication codes for protecting CAN uh, bus messages. How do you actually distribute the symmetric key for that? How do you what? How do you distribute the key that is used for the HMAC, uh, for so the MAC? This key is distributed along the um, the extended CAN frame. So it is sent along with the frames. So when you do the checking, you would actually check if it's if it works or not on the receiver's end. So it's sent along, it's distributed along the CAN frame itself. So how do you secure those messages with the key? Uh, so, um, let me just go back to the slides. Okay, so you have a, a sender and receiver side. So you basically have a, you generate a Mac and then you have on a receiver side, you would uh, verify the key that is being sent. So I think like you would send this on a CAN FD. And you would like, uh, based on the uh, agreement before, you would just verify. And if it's if it's not okay, then you know that someone has tampered with the message. And if it's okay, then uh, you would proceed with the uh, the other other functionalities. Right, but where do you get a secret key from? Oh, uh, okay. So 
uh, I think this is, uh, I'm not really sure, but I think this is um, randomly generated. This is something I do not completely know yet. Okay, thank you. Mm. All right. Are there any other questions today? So then, um, with that, we're going to close the session. Thank you so much for being here, Shivaranjani, and um, have a great day. Thank you.